I wanted to make a point, uh, just to add to that, that you yes, asked why this uh, President Bush has used it uh, so strongly and actually effectively. Uh, a lot of us say that if one political party controls both Congress and the White House, you won't get much oversight, but that's not true. And if you think of the Carter years, the Democratic Congress, particularly the Democratic House, mm -hmm went after departments for information, and if the information wasn't given up, they subpoenaed and they'd hold the cabinet head in contempt, and they did that regularly, and they got the information. And I think several things, I mean, Mitch mentioned one, you can hold people in contempt, and the Justice Department will say, we're not gonna go to grand jury. Mm -hmm. And Congress doesn't seem to have its uh, understanding of itself as a separate branch that has a duty to protect uh, the committees and subcommittees that have a responsibility, so that just the sea change, even in the, from Carter till, till now. Yeah. It, piggybacking on uh, Lou's point, which is uh, congressional power to counterbalance uh, presidential power, I think that's telling within the Bush administration. I mean, here you have, with this absolute immunity claim, a, 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 an investigation by both the Senate and House Judiciary Committees, and at this time, while this is all going on in the President, uh, the Department of Justice and the uh, White House Counsel's Office, is saying we're not going to give you this certain information, we're not going to allow Harriet Myers to testify, yada yada. Well, they have a confirmation hearing for the Attorney General. If I was a Senate Judiciary Committee, I would have said, you're not getting this person confirmed, you're not going to get much out of this in terms of appropriations and judicial confirmations until you do X, Y, and Z. And, and that kind of pushback can happen, and it happened early on in the administration. By the way, when the Republicans were controlling the Senate, uh, before the Jeffords switch, what happened was you had uh, Senator Boxer and Senator Feinstein, the, the two Democratic senators from California, they were uh, cut out of the uh, lower court judicial appointment process. They, Bush was about ready to pick uh, Christopher Cox. I can't remember if it was for an appellate level or a or district level uh, pick there. But he, he was about ready to pick uh, Christopher Cox, a conservative uh, 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 Republican from California. They said, no, we're going to filibuster this person. We'll filibuster anybody in California unless you get us into the process. Uh, even individual members of Congress have tremendous power. The problem is, is the willingness of Congress to combat a presidential power, and I think that's what you saw in that case where they did, where they did do it, and also you saw the lack of will during the Energy Task Force case, and that had those directly a result of Vice President Cheney's office pressing uh, a secrecy claim uh, uh, within the Bush administration. I want to tell one quick story on that uh, on that regard because I think it makes the case very well. In early 2002, uh, the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee was doing its investigation of the Boston mob case. And the Republicans, of course, controlled the chamber at that time. President Bush made his claim of executive privilege. Uh, the chairman of the committee, Dan Burton, called this hearing. Uh, everybody showed up. And a Republican member asked for the privilege to, to speak for a moment. And he says, I got a call from the White House last night asking me to back off. You know, 9-11 just happened, and uh, you know, this is a difficult time for the country. And he said, let me tell you what I think of that phone call. Uh, and then used some rather salty language to uh, describe his feelings about what the administration was trying to do in overreaching and using executive privilege and appealing to a Republican on partisan sentiments that you should back off during this difficult time. Another member says, I got that phone call too last night. And this went member by member, Republicans. Uh, so you know, this, this, it's a good example of how members can, in some cases, put aside their um, partisan preferences and, uh, it, uh, and, and, and their you know, relationship with the president to say that this is profoundly wrong and we have to stand up institutionally for our rights, even if the president is of our own political party and it might serve our temporary political interest to help him out. So uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen often enough. Great. Uh, time for one more question. Here. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is uh, Mr. Hirschberg. This is a brief comment. Um, you're saying that you need to respect the military, but I think in some cases the military uh, uses this as a way to shield itself from criticism. Uh, I mean, the military also has to respect the civilian leadership, and I think uh, they didn't respect Bill Clinton because he evaded the Vietnam draft, but yet he was elected the president. So I think the respect has to flow both ways, and many times 
uh, after Vietnam, it was certainly very uh, horrible that these people got Shanghai by the government uh, drafted to Vietnam and then were, uh, had tomatoes thrown at them by the people when they got home. And I think, but I think now we've, we've reacted to that too far. We're, we're afraid to criticize the military. I mean, the military has been blindly incompetent in Iraq. They didn't, uh, they didn't choose to learn guerrilla ta uh, counterinsurgency after Vietnam. I mean, if uh, John F. Kennedy would follow military advice, there would have been a nuclear war. There have been plenty of uh, uh, instances where the military has been uh, incompetent or downright wrong, and I think that the respect has to flow both ways, and we, uh, the military shouldn't use this. We shouldn't go by, by the, the um, assumption that the military is always going to be right, and we can't offer any criticism. And I think that's what we're down to. No, I, I, I see no military criticism, criticism of the military over Iraq.